Please be seated. And now, please welcome Janine Fink Boyle, Administrator of the Washington Home and Chair of the District of Columbia Health Care Association. Good morning. On behalf of the DC Healthcare Association, welcome to the nation's capital. We are gathered in a city where symbolism and patriotism has remained resilient for hundreds of years, where our forefathers' dedication helped to create a free country and men and women worked tirelessly to create our great nation. Just think about that for a moment. Washington, D.C. is filled with monuments, statues, museums, memorials, all honoring those who stood up for our country, risked their lives, and led our nation as the greatest presidents. Every day we have the opportunity to visit the Washington Monument or the U.S. Capitol. We see the striking architecture of the Martin Luther King, the Lincoln, and the World War II memorials. No matter where you visit in DC, you will find a symbol of our country's history, strength, and patriotism. Patriotism is also on display within those who live and work here, either inside or outside the Beltway. And believe it or not, it is the one thing all of our elected officials actually have in common. As I look out into the room, I know that all of you serve those individuals who helped make our country a better place. You are part of our history and will forge ahead, continuing to make a mark. Each of us plays an important role in advocating for our profession. In Washington, D.C., our association, the D.C. Healthcare Association, has 22 members with over 3,000 beds. We may be small compared to others, but we contribute to a strong, unified voice that represents and protects the needs of those we care for each day. As the chair of the DC Healthcare Association, I am proud to stand before all of you and share our successes. At convention this year, we have two members receiving the National Silver Quality Award, Britton Woods Health and Rehabilitation Center, and Lisner Louise Dixon Hurt Home. I know both of the administrators are in the audience, Ron Chelly and Susan Hargraves. We also have two members receiving the National Bronze Quality Award, Unique Residential Care Center, and my own facility, the Washington Home and Community Hospices. As I stand up here, I also know the administrator of Unique, Rosalind Wright, and CEO, Solange Vivens, are in attendance. I would also like to thank my Director of Nursing, Sharon Adumadu, from the Washington Home, who is also here today. <laughs> Lastly, and not to forget, our Executive Director, Veronica Damson Sharp, for all her support that she gives the DC Healthcare Association. Thank you, Veronica, from all of us. We are excited and full of pride to watch our members be recognized for the quality of care and the service we all provide. It's a difficult and at times a thankless task, but I want to take a moment and thank all of you for your dedication and efforts to make sure our voices are heard by those just down the street on Capitol Hill. I hope you take full advantage of your time here in Washington, D.C., learn from the education sessions, connect with your fellow providers, hear from inspiring speakers, and of course, visit the history D.C. has to offer. I also encourage you to consider getting involved beyond this week. Sign up for AHCA and NCAL's grassroots efforts 
by sending a message to your members of Congress when important long-term care issues arise. Thank you again for being here in Washington, D.C. I wish you all the best. And from all of us at the D.C. Healthcare Association, enjoy the annual convention and your visit to our nation's capital. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the chair of the American Healthcare Association, Len Russ. Good morning. Thank you, Janine, for that warm welcome, and thanks to all of you for joining us at this year's convention. As we begin our program, I want to recognize the people who make this week possible. First, the past chairs of AHC and Cal, who have committed many hours to both our present and future success. In particular, I would like to recognize Bill Rogers Sr., a past chair of AHCA and the South Carolina Healthcare Association, who sadly passed away in August. I also want to thank my colleagues on the AHCA Board of Governors, NCAL's Board of Directors, and all our committee chairs. Of course, a big thanks to our state affiliates and our individual facility members. You are the reason we are here this week. Last, please join me in thanking the staff members at AHCA and NCAL and CEO Mark Parkinson. I also want to thank the organizations we partner with to work on the incredible issues facing our profession. Our friends at NACA, ALNA, and NASAL, we are privileged to work with you and are honored to have many of you here at, our year, at this year's convention. Each year, we spend time recognizing the dedicated professionals who help improve the lives of our nation's seniors and individuals with disabilities. It's also important to remember that organizations that provide the tools and resources we rely on to help us do our jobs each day. Our associate business members and exhibitors are here in Washington as well, and I know they would like to walk, talk with you and display their products with you in our expo hall. I hope you're able to find time after this session to learn more about the products and services that you might not be familiar with. And as we take time to recognize those who help make convention possible, I want to recognize our trusted convention sponsor for 15 years, First Quality, a loyal partner and the official sponsor of this year's convention. And so please join me in thanking First Quality. Please join me in thanking First Quality as we present their Vice President of Sales and Marketing, Seema De La Fraz, with a token of our gratitude. Thank you, Len. Oh, right. <laughs> thank you, Len, and thank you, everyone. It is an honor to be here. First Quality is proud to be a sponsor of this year's convention again. We are dedicated to keeping AHCA members and our customers out in front in today's fast-changing healthcare landscape. Coming together for the annual convention and expo, long-term and post-acute providers and organizations benefit from each other and from industry professionals as they share the latest advancement in healthcare technologies, services, and solutions. Together, we're in pursuit of a common goal, continuous focus on increasing quality of care outcomes, improving the patient and resident experiences, and being more efficient in operations. First Quality shares the same passion through our brand Prevail. We put care into every detail to provide 
unsurpassed quality in our continent's products and programs in the markets we serve. Come visit our booth where Prevail presents Healthcare Academy, a comprehensive quality management system for long-term care. It is a cutting edge, cost-effective, all-in-one package. Today and throughout the week, you have the opportunity to engage with us and other healthcare advocates who can help you find solutions to success successfully meet your everyday challenges. Whatever you seek to gain from this week, whether learning, networking, or planning, we hope you find something meaningful. First Quality, in close with partnership of AHCA and NCAL, is committed to providing continuing education, clinical programs, and resources to advance our shared goals. Enjoy your time at the convention this week. It is amazing to think how fast the year has gone. With 2015 right around the corner, we at First Quality hope that the information you gain here will translate into your success for years to come. Please enjoy the conference, including the social events as well. On behalf of First Quality, we thank you and honor you for the work you do every day. Thank you. First Quality is one of the four top sponsors of our executive leadership program. Through this program, these leading sponsors make generous contributions that help our association achieve our annual goals. In addition to SEMA, I would like to ask the following representatives to stand and be recognized. Bob Hillis, CEO of Direct Supply. Mike Wessinger, CEO of Point Click Care and Sean Scott, Senior Vice President of Medline Industries. Please join me in a round of applause. <laughs> this morning marks the opening of AHCA's 65th Annual Convention. And while AHCA may now be old enough to qualify for Medicare, <laughs> we're by no means entering the age of retirement. In fact, we're just getting started. I myself turned 60 this year, although when I look in the mirror, I still perhaps foolishly see a child of the 1960s and 70s. I know my fellow baby boomers will be those whom we, or I should say you, will be caring for in the not too distant future. But allow me to share some of the milestones that I've passed in my journey to this stage. Some of you may know that I spent the early years of my professional co career as a network television journalist. They were the lionized days of only three major television news organizations, before the 24-hour cable news cycle and well before the advent of social media. It was the twilight of an earlier era when we hammered out our scripts on typewriters we felt part of an elite fraternity of professionals with the unique power to disseminate information to an entire nation and shape and influence public opinion. So what happened? After years of pounding out those thousands of stories, the sheen and veneer began wearing thin. The ideals that drove me into the profession that I could make a difference began to fade in the wake of increased sensationalism and the quest for higher television ratings. What I was doing was regurgitating oversimplified information from the proverbial 30,000 foot level, but not having any tangible impact on anyone's life as I had hoped. The exhilaration of the mass media became just a daily grind with no sense of reward other than simply getting through the broadcast without making any egregious mistakes. Meanwhile, my father ran a skilled nursing facility outside New York City. He was a survivor of the Holocaust and came to America at once to realize the American dream and serve those in need, having been witness to unspeakable inhumanity in the concentration camps of World War II. This was now also the dawn of a new era in long-term care that would usher in dynamic changes in regulations, 
oversight, patient acuity, and emphasis on quality. I witnessed the personal gratification my parents felt improving the quality of life of the residents they housed. At the same time, I witnessed the stigma of that era, which we still too often feel today, that nursing center operators were profiting at the expense of the frail, the elderly, and the indigent. I confronted how wrong and how unfair that stereotype was, and how as a member of the news media, I felt partly responsible for perpetuating that myth. So, I took the plunge. I juggled both careers simultaneously for a few years until going full throttle into post-acute care. And how more gratifying and rewarding it has been. At the same time, I committed myself not only to delivering the best care possible, but to using the communication skills I honed in journalism to channel the message each of you working inside a nursing center knows all too well. But the difficulty comes in conveying that message to the world outside, that we have legions of selfless, humble, and compassionate caregivers who de deliver quality care to the most frail and needy Americans at the lowest possible cost. In the last few years, AHCA has rededicated our commitment to improving quality. Our quality initiative, measured in real data-driven analytical metrics, has yielded astonishing results. And we have successfully delivered the message of those results to public policymakers, consumer advocates, and members of Congress alike. We have also embarked on an unprecedented public education campaign, sharing what we do in our centers from the perspectives of our own residents, family members, and caregivers. Our message is indeed getting through. And it's on top of those core initiatives that we now synthesize our progress on quality, our progress on data outcomes, and our progress on messaging to what could be our most formidable challenge of all, reform of our payment systems to adequately compensate us for what we do so well. Friends and colleagues, this is our clarion call to chart our destiny and to prove that we, as providers, are prepared to take greater risks in exchange for greater rewards in delivering quality care to which we are unconditionally committed. Every year, our sector is on the fiscal chopping block, pitted with financial uncertainty in an era when the private and public sectors are challenged to do more with less. I'm proud to tell you that with the reimbursement cabinet and the payment reform task force I have appointed, we will unveil over the next several weeks a fresh approach to payment and care modeling reform, underscoring that we within AHCA and within this ballroom have the best minds and talent to shape our future. As unconditional as our commitment has been to improving quality, so is our commitment to seize the moment. We will not leave our destiny to the 30,000 foot whims of government bureaucracies, disconnected managed care plans, and a host of newly related entities from conveners to bundlers whose mission, unlike ours, is not the delivery of care, but the siphoning off of ever-shrinking payment streams under the banner of cost savings and efficiencies. As I stand before... As I stand before you this morning, I commit that we will move to achieve our goals with unshakable resolve and seize every opportunity in the days ahead. And together, we will provide the answers for the next generation of Americans who need our care. Not the fleeting soundbite of a news broadcast, nor the immediate gratification of a text or a tweet, but the lasting, enduring rewards we draw from healing those who can no longer care for themselves. Yes, we, more accurately, you are the solution. Thank you very much.
Before we introduce our next speaker, I want to take a moment to tell you about an exciting project that we are unveiling here at convention. One of the many benefits of AHCA membership is access to our exclusive tool, Long-Term Care Trend Tracker. This is an online analytics tool that enables you to access key information that can help you on your quality journey. With just a few clicks, you can gain insight on quality measures, five-star, and much more. It includes features you can't get anywhere else, like risk-adjusted rehospitalization measure developed by our friends at PointRight. And you can benchmark yourselves to your peers to see how you measure up. For the past year, a team of dedicated members have been working on an endeavor to expand LCT Trend Tracker while also making it easier to use. It's been a huge undertaking, and I want to personally thank Neil Pruitt and Mary Oosley for their incredible leadership and vision on this project. I want to thank Neil for bringing LTC Trend Tracker into the future. He's had the foresight of what it could mean for skilled nursing providers. He understands that having comparative data is pivotal in today's healthcare environment. I want to thank PointRight, not only for contributing its intellect in the development of the rehospitalization measure, but also for committing to be the official sponsor of LTC Trend Tracker's relaunch. PointRight's support of advancing quality care knows no boundaries. We also need to thank the Quality Cabinet for its contributions over the past year. Together with the hard work of the AHCA staff and our developer, Synaptitude. I hope you'll take a few minutes while at convention to explore the benefits of LTC Trend Tracker and what it can do for your organization. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the chair of the National Center for Assisted Living, Pat Giorgio. Good morning. When I assumed the role of chair last convention, I was honored to have the opportunity 
to help drive the assisted living profession forward. We are an exceptional extension of long-term care, celebrating choice, dignity, and independence. I am a very deliberate person, so in wanting to do a good job as your chair, I reflected on how far we have come and where we need to go from here. Assisted living has changed so much in the last 10 years, even in the last two years. Many residents are now receiving life-improving therapy services. Technology is being integrated with care processes as well as social activities. And specialized care for individuals living with dementia continues to expand rapidly. Ours is a time of a new normal, an era of new standards, new goals, and a new bar for performance excellence. What may have seemed like a passing fad is here to stay. We are in a new paradigm where constant adaptation and adjustment is the standard and where expectations from a new generation will only rise. A generation unaccustomed to what we do, but accustomed to getting what they want. I have seen this firsthand, and I've heard about it from many of you as well. We're constantly evolving, and we're stronger for it. But at the same time, change can be challenging. Our growth as a profession is exciting. The opportunity to, new, to learn new things is invigorating. But with it also comes anxiety. Will we keep up? Will we stay relevant? I say yes. Because when I look around this room, I see many familiar faces. Some of you have been doing this work for decades. While the world around us has changed, our commitment to our profession has not. For you and for me, it's personal. I actually see long-term care as serving a higher purpose. The Old Testament prophet Micah said, you have been told, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. Only to do the right and to love goodness and to walk humbly with your God. That scripture passage has been my guidepost for a very long time. You see, my, source, my story started with a master's in theology 24 years ago. I believed it was my mission to serve people through pastoral care. However, I soon found that as a woman, there was a glass ceiling holding me back. So I went back to school to get, attain another master's in counseling. It was at that time that a fellow student offered me a temporary job. She was actually the owner of two residential care communities in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I thought, okay, I'll do this administrative thing for a while to earn some extra money while I work on getting my second master's. <laughs> Little did I know. Within weeks, I felt I had done more pastoral ministry in long-term care than in all my time with the church. I had found my true calling. That was my personal journey. Each of you has your own, how long-term care became part of the very fabric of your lives. Sometimes we forget that journey. Sometimes we get lost in all the daily tasks or mounting pressures. But every time we hold a hand or share a smile with one of our residents, it comes back, doesn't it? The work we do is sacred. It is a covenant. We have a commitment to our residents that's unshakable. It's a vow that we have made. This is why we'll survive the new normal. This is why we'll succeed in the face of constant changes and rising expectations. Winston Churchill said, to improve is to change. To be perfect is to change often. So while it may be challenging, while it may cause anxiety, we must embrace the new normal. We must live it. Only then can we master it. We may never be perfect, but we will strive for perfection.
because of our residence, because of the covenant. It is unbreakable. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Executive Director of the National Center for Assisted Living, Dave Kylo. Good morning. Welcome to Washington, or what some people call Hollywood for ugly people. <laughs> if you watch Veep, House of Cards, Homeland or a scandal, you're well prepared because that's exactly what Washington is like, at least some days. Well, here are some tips to help you capitalize on your time in our wonderful city. Check out the monuments at night. They're amazing. When riding a metro escalator, stand to the right. Otherwise, the locals will mow you down. And lastly, consider some, some places off the beaten path. Take a tour of the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. There, you will see millions of dollars being printed. But remember, there are no free samples to take home. Our currency is bursting with rich American history. Just look at the back of a $1 bill, and you will see in God we trust, the eye of providence, and the coat of arms, which contains a specific phrase, e pluribus unum. Now, for those of you struggling to remember from eighth grade history class what e pluribus unum means, it is out of many, one. As a country, we are a federation. Out of many states emerges a single nation. We are also home to many different individuals, races, religions, and ancestries. From that diversity, we gain our strength. What's true for our nation is also true for AHCA and NCAL. We are a federation, and we're formed by many different providers with diverse backgrounds offering various services and facing unique challenges. There are more than 12,000 of you, more than at any other time in our association's history. Thanks to your involvement, AHCA and NCAL have never been stronger. This is so important in a town like DC. We have a lot to cope with here, the partisanship, the egos, the traffic. But we also have to compete with thousands of associations, organizations, and lobbyists. Each one is vying to be heard on the Hill and in the White House. We can't afford to be fragmented. We must come together under a cohesive message, and we have. Expanding our federation comes at a critical time when change is happening in every direction we look. We cannot endure by living in a vacuum. Collaboration is key. Many of our members now offer everything from adult daycare to hospice, and many of our state affiliates now represent home health. We must view all sectors as opportunities to strengthen our reach and further our mission. And we can shape that future by developing so solutions that benefit not just one or two groups, but everyone, especially the individuals we serve. So while we celebrate what makes each of you unique, we cannot be fragmented by our differences. Remember the words on the dollar bill and how those words are the foundation for the greatest nation in the world. E pluribus unum. The phrase you will find when you look up 
at the Capitol Rotunda that was painted during the Civil War when our country was splitting apart to represent how we, as a union, would remain steadfast. As we face the future, we must speak with one voice. AHCA and NCAL are honored to be that one voice for you here in Washington, D.C. And we thank you for giving us that honor. Okay, now it's time for some more Washington, D.C. tips. For an amazing view of this city, go to the top of the W Hotel. For great shopping, go to Georgetown. Best parking lot, the Capitol Beltway. <laughs> Washington is a great place to honor our nation's history and look forward to the future. It reminds us that together, we can get through anything. That out of many, we are one. And together, we can build something monumental. Thank you. The Fairfax is a continuing care retirement community that was developed in the 80s for retired military officers and their spouses. We have a large independent living population. We have skilled nursing, assisted living, and memory support. And we've been aware for a long time the need to reduce the use of antipsychotic medications in our resident population. And over the past few years, we've been able to do that by 56%. Every patient who comes to us from outside who's on any psychotropic gets a psychiatric evaluation. We immediately try to reduce them after observing the patient for a period of time. When we look at people coming in for admission and they might have been put on something in the hospital that they didn't really need, so we talk with Jerry Site and we do the gradual dose reductions. Typically the nursing will notify therapy whether or not medication is either going to be increased, decreased, or even introduced as an option to something that's going on with the patient. Then as therapists we will then enter that patient's plan of care to see if there's anything we can do on our end to see if we can help the patient have a better daily routine. Activities can provide things that are equally as effective in calming or soothing a person, in comforting a person, in redirecting their anxiety, their worries, allowing them to separate themselves from any fearfulness or obsessive tendencies that they may have. So once you've established a good relationship with your resident, they trust you, they love you, they know that you love and you're caring for them, that opens the doors to utilizing a variety of certain methods. Music therapy, art therapy, physical activity and exercise is often extremely beneficial depending upon someone's abilities. It's more important for us to determine what's causing the behavior, find out what is triggering the behavior, what are some non-pharmacological things that we can do to affect the behavior, rather than the first step being a pharmacological intervention. One of the things we try to do is surround ourselves with really good professionals, and we like to present a forum where all of that great input can come together in the appropriate melting pot, which then generates a, a successful outcome for a guest. Social interaction is often magic. People awaken when there's social interaction. People's behavior improves when there's social interaction. We really emphasize the importance of training our team members. So we join our residents with dementia on their journey, and it's amazing to see how that behavioral expression will ease with time when they have a trusted listener and someone who's trained to ask the right questions. Being able to give someone the best and quality amount of care and consideration that you can is critical and extremely rewarding. It's very important to us to create the best environment for them. It's what they deserve and we can do no less. I love being surrounded by professionals that are all geared toward the same thing, which is the absolute best care of our guests. 
Interacting with patients is just rewarding all in itself. They have wonderful stories. They enjoy seeing you every day. You're changing their life, ultimately. It is really rewarding for us to have that daily interaction. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the President and CEO of AHCA NCAL, Mark Parkinson. Well, it is really great to see everybody here. This is quite a crowd. I worried for a couple of years whether people would come to DC, but you have showed up and we really appreciate it. We want you to have a terrific time this week. We, we hope that you pick up a couple things that you can take back to your buildings. But it's also a good time every year at convention to reflect on, on where we've been and where we're going. When I think about the four years that I've been here, most of that time we've been playing defense. We've been playing defense because we've had to. We've been getting attacked from every possible direction. And I think all of you will remember right after I first came, we had an 11% Medicare cut. Some of you may have been wondering, why the heck did we hire this guy? <laughs> I knew that we were in for a lot of work, and to use a phrase from Wizard of Oz, Stacy and I knew that we weren't in Kansas anymore. <laughs> we had had quite a welcome to DC. But that was just the beginning. There were lots of other proposals out there that could have been even worse. In the name of a balanced budget, some wanted to completely eliminate provider assessments. Others wanted to cut us another 4%. And it wasn't just skilled nursing that was under attack, it was assisted living as well. You remember there was a reg out there that would have basically eliminated the use of Medicaid and assisted living. Tens of thousands of people in our buildings would have had to have moved out and spaces would have just been reserved for the wealthy. It's not an overstatement to say that our survival was at risk. And so we played defense because we had to. But to our credit, we did not give up. At the Las Vegas convention three years ago, we made the commitment to each other that we wouldn't back down, and we didn't. Instead of fighting amongst ourselves and becoming divided, we actually became stronger. And as I stand before you today, I'm happy to say that we are all-time record membership, both with skilled nursing, assisted living, for-profit, not-for-profit, big, small, large, you name it, we are at record levels. We've come together. And we also became the solution. On the quality side, we created the quality division at ACA NCAL. We hired the great Dr. Gifford and his team, and they and you created the quality initiative. And the results speak for themselves. Thousands of buildings like the one you just saw have improved their quality metrics around the country. We became the solution on policy. Instead of just saying no, no, no to everything, we took real solutions up to CMS and to the Hill. And we became a political and lobbying powerhouse. We hired every big name lobbyist in town so that we wouldn't be at the back of the 7,000 associations in the line, we'd be more towards the front. And we've doubled and tripled our political efforts so that when you combine our good policy with our deep political activity, we now have real champions on the Hill. So what's been the result of all this over the last four years? Well, the result has been that we have been winning. One by one, we've been knocking down by playing defense all of the attacks that have come at us. We defeated the attempts to reduce the provider tax. We defeated the proposal for the 4% cut. We defeated the horrible assisted living regulation. And so the question becomes now, what do we do next? And the answer is that now it's time to go on offense. It's time to take our newfound strength and go on offense. And that's because there are new risks that simply paying defense will not beat. On the skilled nursing side, it's new payment models. It turns out that there are a lot of people that want to take control of our payment. Somehow all these groups out there that never see our residents, don't care about them one-tenth as much as we do, somehow know more about how to take care of them than we do. Whether it's managed care or accountable care organizations or dual bundles, they all have things in common. 
reduction in length of stay, reduction in rate, exclusion of providers, and nothing good for our residents. If we just sit back and wait and see which of these new models catches on, it's not going to turn out well. The alternative is that we must play offense. Peter Drucker put it this way. He said the best way to predict the future is to create it. The best way to predict the future is to create it. And that is what we have to do. When it comes to payment models, we need to continue the work of our chairman, Lynn Rusk, and the Payment Review Task Force. We need to create our own model. We need to create a model that works for all of our members and that works for our residents, and then we need to get it implemented. But it's not just skilled nursing that needs to play offense. It's also assisted living. There are still those in this town who believe that we need a regulatory system of assisted living that's just as bad or maybe worse than the federal regs on skilled nursing. And there are others who would like to make the regs on skilled nursing even worse. I will tell you that overregulation is the enemy of person-centered care. Thank you. Overregulation forces us to work on things that don't matter, and worse, it forces us to spend less time on the things that really do matter. I believe in person-centered care. When Stacy and I opened up our first facility, it was 42 units, assisted living. The term person-centered care, I don't know if it had been invented yet, we didn't know it, but it's what we try to do in our buildings. We try to take care of our residents on their terms and not on ours. We tried to make it very special. We were independent owners, so we had lots of jobs. One of my jobs was landscaping. I would mow the yard and plant the flowers and the trees and take care of everything. One day I was sitting in one of our residents' rooms named Myrna. Myrna told me that she liked red flowers. And she had a room that overlooked our front garden. So every spring after the final frost, I would plant red marigolds. And they would stay in bloom throughout the summer. And then when the first frost would come along and they would die, I would plant red mums. And those would last until about Thanksgiving. And then when those would die off, I would plant red tulip bulbs that would bloom in the spring. I did that because on as many days as possible, I wanted Myrna to be able to look out her window and see red flowers. Stacy, in title, was our chief financial officer. But in reality, she did, did everything. Mainly what she did was she brought happiness. I would watch her work with the residents and our employees, and it was a beautiful thing. She had a lot of activities. One of them was called chocolate-covered poetry. You can take this idea, it's a good idea. She would read the residents' poems, serve them chocolates that she had bought from chocolatiers in Kansas City. They would all come. I mean, for me to watch this was beautiful. Stacy came to me and she said, this is amazing. The residents really like poetry. <laughs> I said, Stacy, they don't like poetry. They like chocolate. Do you think Walter really liked poetry? You remember Walter. They like chocolate, but mainly they liked hanging around Stacy. I tell you that because as special as the care was in that building, it is not unique. There are thousands of buildings across the country providing that care at this very moment in just that very special way. And it's not just assisted living. It's skilled nursing that has embraced person-centered care as well. I tell you that because I want you to clearly understand that Stacy and I did not move our family out to Washington, D.C. We did not tear up 150 years of family roots in Kansas to come out to Washington and see that taken away from you and taken away from your residents. To those who would believe that they are going to enact a federal regulatory scheme on assisted living and further burden our skilled nursing members, my message is simple. It is not gonna happen on my watch. It is not gonna happen. For us to make bold statements like that though, they don't mean anything unless we put them into action, unless we go on offense. And there's a price. It's not easy, there are no shortcuts, there is a price involved. There is a price in terms of resources. So we need all of you to continue to support our state associations, continue to be members. If you have some facilities that aren't members or if you're members in one state or not another, it's time to end all that and join everyone so that we can bring the maximum possible resources 
to this battle. There is a price in terms of political activity. We need you to continue to be involved with your state association on political activity with our federal PAC to work with us to get your state legislators and your members of Congress in your buildings. We've got to tell our story. And most important, there is a price in terms of quality. Our buildings are a reflection of us. They tell people about who we are. We have to make a commitment to ourselves that we will make every one of our buildings a shining example of what we are all about. Now, when we do all these things, we won't have to stand in line with all the other sectors just waiting to be cut. You know, whenever there's a budget cut in DC where they cut healthcare providers, I go to the association heads that have won to try to figure out what they did that succeeded. And then the folks that got cut, I go and talk with their CEOs to try to figure out what happened. It's amazing how many times CEOs will say, well, it was just our turn. It was just our turn to get cut. You know how often I think it's our turn to get an indiscriminate Medicare or Medicaid cut? You know how often I think it's our turn? Never. It is never our turn. We've been cut enough. Further cuts just hurt people like Myrna and George and all the people that we took care of and the millions of people that are in your buildings, your employees, and when is the right time to hurt them? The right time is never. So when we do all these things, when we go on offense, when we set the agenda, we won't have to stand in line, we won't have to sit around and guess about what's gonna happen in the future, we won't have to worry about whether this will still be a great business for our kids and grandkids, we won't have to worry about the future because we are going to create it. And on behalf of all the staff at Aka and Cal, I can't thank you enough for the opportunity to work with you on this important mission. Thank you all very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back the chair of AHCA, Len Russ. Thank you, Mark, for those inspiring words. All our speakers this morning have reminded us how important our work is. Serving others is truly a calling. I know that our next speaker will help us reflect on the value of service and leadership. As a quick note, for the remainder of today's session, no personal photography or recordings are permitted. Thanks to our keynote sponsor, McKesson, AHC and NCAL are able to bring truly legendary leaders to convention, such as our speaker today. To demonstrate our gratitude, we please join me in welcoming Gary Corliss from McKesson. Thank you. Thank you.